Okay, we're live. Okay, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 94 of the Security Podcast. Tom is back from DerbyCon. And, and what's, I don't know if this is more important, but it is International Podcast Day. So we are celebrating something about the podcast. I mean, I don't know necessarily what it is, but maybe we'll become more powerful, more viewers, <laughs> more just everything else. Yes. Yes to all of that. Yeah, all of it. Because why I mean, limit ourselves? I mean, podcasts are one of those things that everyone seems to talk about, but no one ever seems to download. So they're like, "Yeah, I listen to all these podcasts." Well, can you name one? It was that thing that NPR did that was really good. Yeah, I, I even forget the name, but I hope they do it again. Oh, you mean serial? Yeah. So what else are you going to listen to? I don't know, just that. But I listen to podcasts. <laughs> So I'm here to tell you, before we get into DerbyCon, go listen to podcasts. There's a lot of them. We li I like Pocket Casts. They're 3 or $4. Buy it. You're, it's worth it. And they always have a good discovery feature. We've been on there. So And and find other stuff. Get rid of the commercials. Get rid of the terrestrial radio, I guess, as they call it. And and do something better. If, uh, if you're looking for something open source on Android... I use Antenna Pod. I really like it. Uh, it's kind of buggy from time to time, but it gets the job done. So, well, whatever it is, even the Apple Podcast app, which is horrible, and they don't deny the fact that it's horrible, at least you're doing something. So, right. Support your podcasting person. Anyway, so you went to DerbyCon last week. Indeed, I did. And, and just like last year, it was fantastic. Well, that's great. It's just it goes to show that security conferences so far were two for two on the fantastic, <clears throat> fantastic scale. Yes, very much so. So, was there anything earth shattering? Or, I mean, did we learn how to hack new cars? Or, uh, no, nothing. Nothing earth shattering on a global scale. Some stuff that's really interesting that I want to play with, dig in deeper. Um, it's not when when you go to a security conference. It's not so much, um, you know, a, a press event for normal people. Uh, I guess Black Hat and DefCon. Some of the talks are more geared towards just getting the word out in a big way. DerbyCon's not really like that. It's more, you know, security professionals, hackers, pen testers. Um, not really into the breaking news kind of business. There was some cool stuff there. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but nothing that uh, you know has absolutely blown my mind. Well, at least you, I mean, if there's nothing, well, at least you go to the, con the conference part, but you get to see all the same people, right? It sounds like all the same people from DEF CON and Black Hat just show up. And, yeah. And so now you get to talk more in depth about everything else, which is always the best part of it. Oh, yeah, very much so. Uh, there's, there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of people working with each other to do stuff. There's a lot of partying. You know, I just like with DEF CON, it's always a party. Um, but uh, there's there's good stuff. Uh, and DerbyCon isn't all hard technical talks, not at all. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on social engineering, which was fantastic. I went to a lot of those talks. There's a lot of stuff on, hey, uh, you're a developer or you're an IT manager. Here's how to make other developers or your users uh, more secure. Here's how to teach them about security, push them in a proper direction. Well, look, that's, that's always a good thing. It's always good that, again, I kept on saying this at DEF CON, everyone wants to be more secure, but no one's there to say how to do it the right way. Right. And, and I guess it's because you're talking to the experts. Everyone's an expert that goes there and you're never going to get, you're never going to get the person who leaves the front door open to go to a security conference. In fact, they'll probably say, Oh, you're a bunch of hackers and evil goes on there rather than anything else. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to, Derby County is a really, really friendly place. I don't want to uh, put out that it, everyone that goes there is an expert. I certainly don't consider myself an expert. I consider myself, you know, knowledgeable, but um, you know, I, I am not a, a pen tester in my day job. Uh, I'm not writing exploits. I'm not deconstructing shell code. Uh, there are there are people there that are way smarter than me, and there are people in there that don't really know a whole lot about security, but they wanted to learn, so they came. 
uh, in DerbyCon, and everyone there are really accepting of everyone, as long as people want to learn and they're interested in something. Well, that you, I mean, I think everywhere is like that for the most part. I haven't been to too many security conferences. I don't think I've been to any where people have said, I don't want to help you go away. Right, right. Hackers can be a really friendly bunch to anyone who's got curiosity. Because they want to spread the knowledge. They want to spread everything. And, we, exactly. and we've said this. So it's always good to even – so don't feel bad. And I bet you you do that, uh, that at Ohio InfoSec. You want the general public to come and you give them cake. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, we give out cake. We, we give breakfast. We give lunch. Uh, at, at Ohio InfoSec, you know, it's open to literally everyone and their mothers. Um, we've, we've had, you know, uh, hackers wives attend where they don't know a whole lot about security, but they wanted to see what goes on. They were interested in, you know, what we did for a Thursday night every month. Um, so they came out to the group, they learned a bunch, had some discussions. It's always a good time. So if you had to, so you're at DerbyCon, you're partying it up, you posted in the show notes, one of the things, is that the main thing that we learned how to train the users? Um, there's, there's a lot of main things. Um, this one is probably one of the more <clears throat> accessible to our audience, the, the people who aren't, you know, the security professionals, but maybe they're working in a company, maybe, maybe they work in IT. Um, this talk in particular is really geared towards them. It's geared towards helping them. Well, that's great. So what happened? <clears throat> well, this talk is uh, is by Ben Tan and uh, Tottenkopf, I think. I think I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, anyway, um, those two gave a great talk called "How to Change the Way Your Users Respond When the Bell Rings," uh, and it's it's basically how to just like with Pavlov's dog, how to train your users to do the right thing when security stuff happens. When they get the pop-up that says, hey, download this thing. Uh, when you know the drive-by download uh, drops a Java file and it says, oh, hey, you should probably run this super security update or we'll cancel your email account. Um, they go into how do you craft a security program in an organization, in a business that trains users to respond properly given the, you know, given a security stimuli. Well, that's good. I mean, it's always hard to explain to people <clears throat> when they send you an attachment and you say, hey, why didn't you look at it? Well, somebody told me never to download attachments. Right. And you can't say, no, that's not true. Because to be honest, it's probably better that you walk over a USB drive at that point. But you want them to say, hey, you want them to understand the difference between the, uh, the right attachment and the wrong attachment. And I think that's harder. So everyone just says, don't download the attachment. Right, right. Uh, they they do go into that. They go into the, yeah. We we give a lot of rules. We expect people to have common knowledge that you know of knowledge that we expect to be common knowledge. Like uh, use a password manager. Don't use the same password everywhere. Don't use your your dog's name as your password. You know stuff like that. But in reality, normal people don't operate that way. They don't think that way. They've got a job to do. And security slash IT tends to be, you know, the ban hammer, tends to say no, tends to be condescending when they come out with rules or suggestions or acceptable use policies or and it basically treats their users like children. Uh, and it's it, it really hurts you when you're trying to make users more secure, but you're treating them like children at the same time. And, and we can argue both ways, but... I mean, we see it every year. Uh, they reset all the users' passwords at my work, and I have to get everyone in. And then they don't change it because one of the things they force you to do is change it within the first 10 logins. Then it locks you out. Then they have to call the help desk, get their password reset. That's now the second password. Oh, no, the password they changed it to is the third, <clears throat> which was their password they want to use, and now they can't because it takes the last five. So they put something really easy so they remember. They end up forgetting. It's this vicious cycle. Because instead right. of explaining to them how important this is or or why they do it, they just say this is what it is and it's for security. Right. It's one of those catch-alls. Like 
Where is IT? If IT calls, IT is this amorphous blob that lives somewhere in the company, but we don't know where they are. They just show up. Yeah, you know, you know, it would be awful if you yourself had to call IT because they're going to put you through the ringer. They're going to make you go to an obnoxious ticket system, fill out 100 different fields. You probably will fill out the wrong one, and they'll say, oh, well, this ticket's invalid. Uh, we'll close it, and you'll have to do the whole process over again. You'll probably be on hold for at least 10 minutes, and the guy who answers thinks you're an idiot. He's like, well, you know, why didn't you reroute the starboard power coupling? I mean, come on. Everyone does that. Well, he's and, probably wearing a Jordy LaForge visor or Google Glass. <laughs> it's, so it's it's one of those things that, that they've learned that, so they don't want to call because if something goes wrong, it gets put on some queue that takes three or four at least days to be looked at. And if they're trying to get the projector working because they need a new bulb, they just give up. They just don't right. say anything because yeah. that, I'm going to do this for what? So what they do is they come to me. And I have to casually explain to them, hey, look, I really do like you, but I also have a job, and I need you to call the help desk. I need you to put it in writing. If they don't, if they can't come in a timely fashion, I'll do it, and I'll explain it to you. And then I get the, but you're really good at this. Can you just fix it for me? It'll take you right. one minute. And at that point, you're like, oh, fine, one minute. You know what? They're going to like me. I'm going to get some good karma on the backside, but... You're not training them to do the right thing. You're not training them to go through this. Or they're going to hear that, oh, if you put this, if you put hotspot, insert VPN name here, that's free, this will get you to the internet if you're just trying to get YouTube, rather than to explain why we're not allowed YouTube at school or the other or various other social networks. Right. And, you know, it, it would be truly awful if – something even even not security wise but let's let's say something broke let's say an application stopped functioning when they did something or in the worst case let's say they did download an attachment they double clicked on the you know invoice.pdf.exe file and now their system starts behaving weird or getting slow or pop-ups happen everywhere or some remote control stuff starts happening in front of them, right? Do they want to call IT? No. IT is going to, you know, bring down the ban hammer and yell at them. Uh, in certain companies, I've heard of, you know, IT firing people for uh, infractions like that. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so they, they don't want to call IT because they're afraid they'll get in trouble. So, you know, sweep it under the rug and, and hope nobody looks. Um, and it's – all of these problems can be fixed. Uh, they really can. And it's it's fairly easy, uh, but it does take uh, a mind shift for IT because uh, IT does cause a lot of problems. They cause a lot of, you know, uh, just standard – the users liking IT problems, but it also leads into security problems. Um, because if you don't like IT and IT is telling you to do something and you don't understand why that thing is and they're not giving you a good reason or they're treating you like a child, if you say, well, why do I have to use a different password everywhere? And the guy rolls his eyes and walks away. They don't care. They're not going to help you enforce those rules. They're going to do everything they can to circumvent it and get on with their lives. Um, IT and security, uh, you know, if those things are separate, and a lot of places are the same thing, um, really are the first step in in getting people to like them, respect the decisions, the choices, and most of all, understand them. Uh, if you can be friendly with your users, if if the users are comfortable with IT, they'll be comfortable asking questions. They'll be comfortable coming to you for understanding, and you'll be comfortable explaining why. Uh, you know, they they can't just plug in random USB sticks they find in the parking lot. I've, I've tried to explain to people what a USB <clears throat> condom, condom is, and I haven't gotten too far. I think we need to call it a different right. word. But I've explained to them that this is. Different things like that. Oh, what did you learn at DEF CON? And it's don't pick up random USB keys. And, and the next thing they say is, what, you don't like getting free USB keys? And I go, no, I don't. <laughs> they're, they're spam. That, that's like literally what they are. It's a one gigabyte stick with some press release on it. Yeah. And it's, well, anyway. But basically. In the best of cases. Yeah. It's got a press release on it. 
Well, I mean, in in the in the edu- in the educational sphere, that's what it is, because they're trying to get you to wear it on your uh, on your on your ID, so you have like another advertisement on it. Yeah. But that's what we started in school, and we have an IT. We have like a, a teacher IT crew where the teachers are supposed to. They take some of, some of the time that they're supposed to be on their duty. They call it. And they're supposed to sit in the library and when teachers have a question, go there as more of a sort of friendlier IT. The problem is that the IT stigma is still so bad that people don't want to do it. Or you get this other thing like, oh, at our monthly meeting, we're going to talk about this. So after school or whenever your Monday morning meetings are when no one cares, we have to listen to a 10 minute spiel on some security thing that no one cares about. How to sign out the PSATs. Well, if you've been teaching for 30 years, it's the same thing for 30 years. So now you just gloss over it. If you're new, the the the, the, pro, the person explaining this thinks that everyone's heard this enough, so the new people don't get enough information, and you've accomplished nothing except w- wasting everyone's time. Right. But we haven't found a way necessarily to combat that. You give a memo, no one reads it. So you have to say you have to show up. And if you say you have to show up, nobody wants to show up. And if you say do this on your own time, then it's, I don't have time to do this on my own time. So we, yeah. we fall back into this catch-22 of how do you teach the security in a way that's meaningful or or not so the person can understand rather than, oh, they're forcing me to do this nonsense. And, and really for, for the majority of security best practices, uh, if you get someone and, and you know, they go into this in the talk, uh, if you get someone to care about something that they can take home. If you get someone to care about, you know, uh, their personal safety or the, you know, information privacy concerning their family or their children, uh, they'll actually care. They care then because it means something to them, uh, because it affects their lives in a personal way. Um, You know, caring about intellectual property rights of a global manufacturing firm, ah, yeah. I mean, they, as long as they keep paying me, I don't really care. Uh, but as soon as you say, well, you know, have you made sure that, you know, your son's email isn't the same as their, their Facebook password or, or is your Facebook the same as your email password? Because if one thing is compromised, everything is compromised. And then, you know, they could access all the messages you've been sending to your family or they can log into your Google calendar and see, you know, your doctor's appointments or you know, who knows what. Um, if, if you explain it to them, to users in a way that they can take the lessons and apply it to their personal lives and get a benefit out of it that they understand, they will naturally do it at home and they'll bring it into the workplace. But we've, we have talked about that before. Um, you know, like uh, when it comes to passphrases, uh, companies say, well, you know, you've got to have X number of characters and get this big, crazy long thing. And uh, users simply don't care. They're, they're going to make something easy. They're going to write it down. They're going to put every, you know, 30 days when they change the password, they're just going to re-enumerate the month. Well, we're going into October, so my password is now going to say October instead of August. Um, if you just say, hey, you know, give me 15 characters plus, it can be anything, but it's got to be at least 15 characters. Uh, and you show people how that's a better password system. Uh, they'll take that, they'll use it at home, they'll use it at work, and all of a sudden you've decreased the amount of calls to the help desk, and your users like you because you've made something more simple and technically better. Until, and and I absolutely agree with the password, until they go somewhere and they're met with this horrible JavaScript form that says, oh, you have too many special characters. Right. And then now, and I didn't believe this. I, I, I explained this to my dad, and he's, and he's really good at listening. He gets it. But he doesn't want to follow it because he says, but this website requires my this. And you go, how could it be? And you go there, and they're like, yeah, we need at least eight characters, four numbers for this. Uh, only these special characters, dollar sign underscore, but none other. Right. And you're like, and you're like, because I used to tell people and put dot and then your favorite TLD. So make your password something, whatever it is. So if it was your dog's name, 
uh, fluffy.com will make you so much more secure, even though now that it, the cat's out of the bag there, they're going to put that on the top of the, the rainbow table. But choose another, uh, what's it called, TLD. There's a whole bunch of them, and, and just figure it that or, way. Or you can, you can even just, you know, add your, your own personal twist on a password. Just, you know, I, I know some people that have used, uh, you know, site name dot com uh, slash and then that's where their password goes so it's technically unique uh, now if the clear text ever got leaked it would be really easy to you know reverse engineer that person's logins across every site so I don't really recommend that uh, but it does satisfy the requirement of making a different password everywhere but I agree with you I've seen those sites that say well you have to have 11 characters but it's gotta have only underscores, periods, and the letter R. And you're like, ah, that doesn't make any sense. Technically, if you're doing your password collection and storage correctly, you could use any character under the sun, and the computer won't care. But If you're um, hashing it, yeah, if you're uh, hashing it, it doesn't matter what your password is. Right. There should be no limitation because you're hashing it. But, you know, that... that Brings up a good point. They actually cover that in the video, um, and that that gives you, uh, as the IT or security person and your users, something to bond over um, and something to explain. Like, well, the re the technical reason behind it is because of this. You don't have to go into the te the technical reason. Even you could just say, "Uh, I know." It, they're not doing it the right way, and they should be, and they're bad human beings for it. Uh, and and you can just hate on you know site X Y Z um, for for creating that awful awful password form. It's it's like like we've been saying. It's too hard. Everyone is too busy to sit down and understand why the security matters until it's too late, or some sort of breach happens to them, and then they start caring. Right. And unfortunately, so. So it just, <clears throat> this won't happen to me until it does. And then when it does, the world ends and no one's willing to listen to you because it just happened to you. Oh, my credit card got stolen and, and uh, they charged thousands upon thousands of dollars. And I go, well, what did you do about it? Somebody's drag racing out of your window. They really are. It's like uh, somebody charged tens of thousands of dollars and I don't look at it as, Oh, I'm sorry you were inconvenienced. Like now somebody has their insurance write off that claim of ten thousand dollars because you were really bad with the security. Right. I mean, yes, and credit cards do get stolen randomly and, and most of the time it's not any one person's fault. Because at least credit cards we think of back at a time where you were responsible at least for uh at least fifty dollars. Mm. Now it's at zero, but it used to be $50 or $100 or something like that. And losing a wallet with six cards meant that you were out $300. Well, one, one thing to keep in mind um, is that you know, when it comes to security, when it comes to teaching people things, uh, punishments don't work that well. Uh, they're, they're not really effective. They're not the most effective way of teaching someone. The best way to teach is rewards. Uh, do you remember when Google put out that uh, security assessment and if yes. you went through it and enabled two-factor, you got like two extra gigs of Google Drive or five or something? They Absolutely. Said, they said, hey, you made your Google account more secure. Here's this thing. Monetarily, it doesn't really cost us anything because we are made of storage. Uh, but, you know, I know you'll like it, and I know you're going to tell other people to make their accounts secure so they can get free stuff, too. That is great. I imagine the amount of two-factor, uh, you know, users on Google skyrocketed during that week of that promotion. It's fantastic. Uh, ben Tan in his talk uh, goes into, um, into this uh, – I'm trying to think of the – a uh, good word for it, essentially <laughs> a contest for his users um, where he said, hey, in your day-to-day -day job, if you see something that could be a security vulnerability, something that could be exploited, report it to IT and you'll get points. And at the end of a month, the person with the most points gets a Visa gift card of X number of dollars, which is fantastic. It got people 
thinking about security constantly because it's a game at that point, because they can win something, because there's money on the line. They think, huh, how could I? They start thinking like a hacker. How could I destroy this system? How could I bypass controls? How could I <clears throat> use this thing in a way it wasn't intended to be used? And they're not and they're not afraid of doing something wrong because right. IT told them do this. Whereas if you do something <laughs> slightly wrong, you're afraid that you're going to be called in and being told that you weren't supposed to do this. Format format the C drive. That was a bad yeah. idea. Yeah. And now you're going to be punished. Right, right. Uh, so it, he, he said it, it really worked very well. It got people thinking about security. Uh, and, you know, if you hold... It doesn't have to be an everyday sort of thing that would burn people out. But, you know, if you do it once, twice a year, just to to get people in the mindset of how do I use this system against itself, it would be fantastic. And at least now we're talking computer security, but physical right. security is also the same idea. Yes. I mean, I, I try to explain to my uh, outgoing seniors <laughs> that you're going to get to college and you're going to see someone running down in the pouring rain trying to get into your dorm and they look like a student they feel like a student they're carrying like a coffee in one hand and, and their phone in the other and you don't know where their id is but you know what they look innocent and then you get bombarded with uh, pizza delivery ads right and 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 you're like and when you tell them don't let them in and you're gonna but 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 and you're gonna say you know what it's even though human nature says that you want to be nice, you got to learn to say, hey, look, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we actually, uh, back when I was in college, um, that exact situation happened, except it wasn't pizza ads. Uh, the guy walked away with uh, like two or three laptop computers and a book bag. Um, it was uh, kind of a learning experience for the entire dorm building of, hey, yeah, it's it's you know human courtesy, and we're just trying to be nice by holding the door for people. But you know, when it comes to tailgating, it does have serious repercussions. Most of the time, nothing will happen, but all it takes is that one time, right? Well, now those people on that floor—I bet you the entire floor will never allow that to happen again. Right, and people will actually lock the doors. I mean, that that's the. That's unfortunately what it takes. It takes this really negative event for them to start caring. Right. And if you can try it, and that's the hard goal, is if you can recreate that event without something bad happening, then people will start listening. Which is where the reward system comes in. If there was a, you know, a, a contest, maybe like a secret shopper holding the coffee and the phone in the rain and, you know, it's some guy stops him and says, I'm sorry, sir, but you have to swipe your card at the door to get it to open. I can't just let you in. And he goes, yes, here's, you know, a hundred bucks to the convenience shop uh, on campus or something. Um, you know, taking potentially negative situations and when people do the right thing, rewarding them for that. Uh, I, I know, uh, you know, when it comes to secret shoppers in major department stores, they do that all the time because, uh, you know, uh, floor workers are trained to say a certain catchphrase to a customer. And if they say the certain catchphrase and they're really good at their job and showing them, you know, where this thing is or helping them with a the problem, they'll get, you know, a pat on the back and a bonus. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's not, you know, a million bucks kind of bonus, but it's good. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you've done the right thing. And people will remember that. Yes, they remember the negative things more, but when it comes to teaching and training, positive reinforcement is always the way to go. So, well, anyway, we're, we're running out of time, and I don't necessarily want to go over today. Right. So let's, uh, let's wrap this up and let's go. So we will have the talk in the show notes. I highly suggest you check it out. Take a spare hour. Uh, you know, Ben 10 and Totenkopf are awesome. Go watch the talk. Okay, so we will see everyone next week. Have a good day.